been dropping. What the studies don't show and what analysis shy away from is this. Really expensive handbags have never had a better day. Based on many years of study, I can conclude long ago that barring something like lifetime imprisonment or a crushing depression, the rich are always rich, regardless of what may be happening in the general economy. And social class, as I've emphasized many times, is based on lifestyle. <clears throat> likewise, likewise, people who are wealthy enough to purchase very expensive handbags will continue to buy their favorite brands. Manufacturers of high-end merchandise know this. Consequently, if you're hooked on Louis Vuitton, you can still buy the Twist MM <coughs> in yellow epi leather embroidered with parrots to show the spirit of travel for $4,400. That's for a handbag. A Gucci Dionysus medium embroidered hobo bag with either birds or flowers goes for $3,300. But if you're a little strapped for cash, the smaller title hobo sells for $3,100. For those not yet addicted to ridiculously high prices for a sack in which to carry their lipstick and pepper spray, this Prada's large Sophia uh, uh, travel tote bag in navy, which kind of resembles a bowling bag for $2,225, and it has snap closures, two zip pockets, and three slip pockets. Still too high? In suede, how about Saint Laurent's Cabas tote bag in light ochre at $1,990. Ralph Lauren's Tiffin's 27 satchel and towel is uh, available for $1,950 at Bergdorf Goodman. And Givenchy's Ant uh, Antigone Evening Clutch, just perfect for a night at the opera, is $1,395 at Neiman Marcus. By the way, it looks like a black vanilla envelope. And here's a great bargain at Vestier. Versace's $1,429.30 patent leather, leather handbag is marked down to just $1,416.91. On the other hand, if these somewhat pedestrian pocketbooks are somehow too bourgeois, try Lana Marks. Her creations are carried by Angelina Jolie, Jennifer Aniston, and a whole bunch of other notables whose photos appear on her website. However, her products are so exclusive that one must fill out a resume just to get a glimpse of them. Price, of course, is not mentioned, which is as it should be from the perspective of the nation's top tier or all's well in the economy. So, kind of like my criticism of other things, you know, buying an expensive handbag is not necessarily um, any kind of um, uh, indication of one's social class. But it's one of those things that people in everyday life can understand and relate to. Um, and I've done this over and over again. Um, I found some ridiculously expensive, expensive Easter bunnies, and then, this is not published yet, but uh, tomorrow um, I have one coming out on how coffee separates the rich from the poor. So, oh, any comments on those kinds of things? Yeah. Well, so I think what you're doing is admirable, but I think we've got a structural problem going on and that we've lost the public comments. Um, you know, newspapers are dying right and left. My students don't read them at all. Uh, my colleagues don't read them other than a glance at the New York Times magazine or a, you know, a Washington Post briefing that they can look at headlines for 10 minutes before they go to class. And what we've got is, I think, to a great extent now in America, is the balkanization of media so that every, you know, they, you've got your Twitter followers and you guys are complaining about 400 or 1,000 words and now we're looking at 140, now 280 yeah. characters. Um, or, you know, I, I listen to these three podcasts and I, in, you know, but the people across the street from me don't do that. And those days when everybody read the local paper um, are rapidly disappearing. And so this, I, the dissemination of opinions and knowledge, I think, is becoming increasingly difficult across large populations. I, mean, I don't have any answer for that. Uh, and I think it's probably just going to grow worse. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree with you. And, I, and I've done a couple of poems about 
um, the fact that newspapers are dying out all over the place. Um, and of course, that's one of the reasons that I'm here, is because I'm old and I'm old school. You know, so to me, you know, new, I still read newspapers. Um, well, at, but I'm too, part of a small, a small group of mostly older people who do. Um, so I'm kind of looking for the younger people to say, well, you know, how do, how do we get this across to a generation that has come certainly after my time? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I know right, somebody who reads four newspapers every day, um, physical copies, but that what's happened increasingly is like my local paper, so from Stockton, the Stockton Record, has dropped all local commentary, all local coverage, right? Um, I mean, there's not even theater reviews or restaurant reviews or movie reviews written by local folks, much less anything much more intellectual than that. And increasingly, what's in the stock and record looks like what's in the San Francisco Chronicle. It's the same stuff, and they're just pulling stuff off the press, off the wires, um, and using stuff within the large, the larger thing. So I don't, and I don't know how you, you know. You, 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 yeah, I mean, I could do, I could do a blog. Um, but beyond the 300 people I can get to read their blog, mm -hmm. like the days of, I think of being able to reach 100,000 people, mm -hmm. potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a good point. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I haven't spoken to Don Moff about how many people visit his um, site, but I assume it's, I'm, I'm guessing it's quite a lot. I did talk to um, Earl Babby about his site, the Solupropp site, and he said he has about uh, 46,000 people who have visited it, and they've made about 69,000 uh, contacts. Uh, it's my first time. I went back several times to read other other things, and I assume that's what other people have done too. But still, that's not reaching the mass. <laughs> Yeah. When you were talking about like the media, like there's a lot of psychologists and like you know media and like TV shows and movies, which are essentially forms of art. I think if you look throughout like art history, there's lots of psychological art. But I I've seen obviously there's a lot of artists throughout like the past thousand years who activists have been it. What was sociology? But there's not that long-standing historical connection of psychology and art versus sociology and art. And I think to like connect more like he was saying documentaries. And like mm -hmm. more artsy types, like that kind of connection between the two fields hasn't happened as strongly as say like psychology, mm -hmm. which I think would be a big step towards like more media pushes or more like thinking minds putting it out there type of thing. Mm -hmm. that yeah, it does. And in fact, I hadn't thought about this until you mentioned it. But if you look back at the history of art, I think you'll see a lot more of the art of say the I'm going to say the 19th century, that, that did address sociological issues. Um, Pablo Picasso's Guernica uh, certainly was a sociological issue. Um, David's The Death of Marat uh, addressed sociological issues. But I don't think we see it anymore. Mm. I, I see a lot of psychological art even today, but not so much. But not so much sociological, yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I just, um, I saw an exhibit by an artist whose mother was schizophrenic. And he, in his art, he does painting. And he was trying to, to do it, trying to do a painting as it might be seen by his mother. And it was a very personal thing, and he gave a presentation. Um, it was a kind of, almost a tearjerker kind of thing. But uh, there again, it was psychologically oriented, not sociologically. I haven't done a study of it, but my impression is that a lot of political cartooning and humorous cartooning is sociological. I'm, yeah. And I think it would be a great student project to uh, go through and, and spot those things. And for a student, you could just say, this is a good example of this concept or this social fact. Uh, but because it gets called political cartoon or humor, uh, we don't spot it. So, somebody want to do a paper for next year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, and of course, the political cartoons, where do you find them? Newspapers. And but, but they show up on the internet. Do they? Yeah. Okay, that's good. And, and I'm not very internet savvy, so uh, they might <coughs> be places where you can yeah. One of the things that, um, one of the reasons that I, that I keep writing this, this column, and probably the same reason that, that Gordon does, is that, um, is that sometimes we can have a little fun with it. I don't know if I brought anything that was fun, though. I did. Um, in in the, the, the booklet that's in the back of the room there, um, I can send any, any of the, these columns to you by email. Um, but there's there's two pages of columns that are humorous. A lot of them, of course, had to do with Donald Trump because I mean, <coughs> you know, I don't think there's anything funny about him today, quite honestly. There's not a thing about him that makes me giggle. But during the campaign, he was hysterical for me. Um, one of the, uh, oh, wait, maybe I did. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's one. Um, when Christmas time rolls around, of course, I, I do my column every week, and so I have to have one at Christmas. And so everybody who reads my column thinks I'm the Bah Humbug guy, which probably is pretty close to the truth. <laughs> and this is one that I wrote on um, December 29th, uh, 2011. I'm glad it's over. Christmas is not my favorite time of year. No, I'm not making one of those post yule Bah Humbug complaints. In fact, I'm rather joyous now that my car radio has stopped playing all those obnoxious tunes to which I'm subjected on an annual basis. For example, there's a little ditty about a member of a team who is subject, who is a subject of discrimination due to a birth defect. The other players won't let him participate in their activities because of a medical condition that is similar to the one suffered by the late comedic actor W.C. Fields. He was constantly a subject of criticism and ridicule. Then, one foggy evening, the coach called on this poor victim to assist in a momentous chore, and it was the rhinitis that proved to be so valuable. Because of the advantage gained by the, secular, by the singular incident, uh, accident of birth, the other team members granted acceptance to the sufferer, allowed him to join their rituals, and predicted that he would actually attain historic significance. So the story has a happy ending, but my point is that had it not been for the sole occasion when the creature's affliction was desperately needed, he'd have been a continuing victim of bias and scorn. Call me the Grinch who stole Christmas, but I don't see this tale as one that is particularly complimentary to the human condition. What song is that? Yeah, right. Another ballad <coughs> informs us about a beloved family member who forgets to take medicine imbibes in too much holiday nog on the night before Christmas and gets trampled to death by a rogue car car caribou. The next day her husband mourns her passing by watching football on TV and drinking massive quantities of fermented spirits. The rest of the family is bothered by two essential questions. First, should they open the deceased presents or return them for a monetary refund? Second, should the DMV issue a license to an old fool who claims to drive a sleigh and play with elves. What song is that? Grandma got run over by a reindeer. Yeah, Grandma got run over by a reindeer. Okay. I'm not merely saddened but outraged when I hear the song about a young child who is tucked in bed by her mother on Christmas Eve. However, the poor tot can't sleep because of some commotion that is going on <clears throat> in the first floor living room. The girl sneaks out of bed, creeps down the stairs, and sees her mother making out with some strange hirsute man who is decked out in a pimp-red outfit. 
To make things worse, the adults move to a part of the room where some type of arboreal disease is growing through the ceiling and begin playing some sort of tickle game. Now I ask you, is this the kind of thing to which we want to expose our children? The song ends with the little girl wondering how our father would react if he had witnessed this incident of infidelity. What song? <coughs> I saw mama kissing Santa Claus. Yet another bit of music combines confusion along with paranoia. In this case, a boy seems to be talking to a small sheep. They are asking each other if one hears what the other hears. They wonder if one sees what the other sees. Certainly in their own, in their own senses, um, I'm sorry, certainly their own senses are, are obviously challenged. Delusion enters the picture as the boy speculates about the possibility of the sheep knowing what he's thinking. Then they both begin hearing a voice in their heads. I only hope it's not Sam, the dog next door. Do you hear what I hear? Exactly. Oh. And who is Sam, the dog next door? I don't know. Remember Sarah Killen and David Berkowitz? Oh, okay. He got his messages from Sam the dog. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the saddest songs of the season involves the creation of a statue that is made of snow. The child sculptors imagine their muse inhabits the form and causes it to dance around. <clears throat> this man of snow becomes their friend, laughing and playing with him. He runs to the center of town, daring the kids to catch me if you can. But as the sun begins to shine, the children's friend begins to suffer from strange illness, possibly a form of albinism or some other type of photophobia. Gradually he fades away, waving to the kids as he leaves them behind in sorrow. Anybody? Oh, Steve, the snowman. There are some songs of the season that simply make us feel sad. First is the little boy singing that he wants nothing for Christmas except his two front teeth. He must be one of those kids we see on the television commercials that requests us to send 1995 so that a village may be fed for the year and the children can all be college educated. Then there's the young girl who expects so little from life <clears throat> that her favorite things are rain drops on roses, whiskers on kitten, snowflakes that stay on her nose and eyelashes, and warm mittens. Come on, folks. Real healthy kids don't just wish for, but expect video games, $300 sneakers, and cell phones with at least 150 apps. As children age, a check would be preferred. The larger the amount, the better. And don't ask how they're going to spend it. Follow la 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 la. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so the payoff to, to writing a column about these kinds of things is that once in a while I get to have a little fun with it. So, um, are there any other comments, or do you want to hear about any of these other things? This is a social strat. Um, I have a really interesting one here, which I think maybe I will read to you. But, um, here are some of the other kind of topics that I picked up. In the, in the booklet that's in the back of the room there, which you free to take, uh, I have them by category. Um, so, under uh, crime, student travel, no time for pranks. This is about the uh, student who went to North Korea, <coughs> and uh, he s took a poster off the wall, and they put him in jail, and he was sent back in a coma, and then died. Yeah, so, um, social change in technology. Uh, clean may be coming to a store near you. Um, this, this goes back, actually, I started out with a quotation from Winston Churchill back in 1930s. Uh, and the idea is, uh, why grow an entire steer if what you want is a steak? Why not just grow the steak? Now it's possible. It's been done experimentally, and uh, two of the big food giants are now involved in this. So uh, the idea of having meat come to us that doesn't actually come from an animal, but um, rather comes from something that they, they think is going to be, look something like a brewery. Um, 
will be available in stores. Um, and then I have a, a part in there that's miscellaneous, just things I couldn't fit into other, another category. <clears throat> uh, this one I would like to read to you because I, I think this, um, it, it's, these are women who, whose work has been unsung, um, but I think it's important to, to understand the, the role of women in the past in our society that was totally overlooked. Okay? So this is a short one, it's not like that. This is one I, I edited down. March is Women's History Month. As usual, I'm going to take a road less traveled. Many of the unsung heroines of the United States past can be found among the 167 female lighthouse keepers. Today, most lighthouses are run on electricity, are automated and perform the same important function as they have for hundreds of years. <clears throat> These remote beacons had to be among the most difficult places in the world to live. The work was hard, the day was long. <clears throat> During a bad storm, 24 hours um, for days on end. In the early years, the light was provided by whale oil lamps, which were difficult to keep burning. Four heavy wicks had to, to be trimmed constantly to keep them from smoking up the glass. Nevertheless, the glass was always, always collected soot, which had to be wiped out so the light would remain bright and visible to passing ships. Several times per night, the keeper would have to climb the stairs inside the tower to perform these duties, night after night, <clears throat> and in all kinds of weather. Then, of course, there were daytime tasks like doing repairs, fetching supplies, keeping the boats in good condition, and so forth. Often, the keeper's wife was his assistant, and when the husband died, the wife became the new keeper. Although the government was reluctant to hire these women in the, nascent, the new nation, uh, often there was no alternative. So Lighthouse Keeper became one of the earliest non-clerical government occupations for women. In 1775, John Thomas and his army rebelled against the British on the outskirts of Boston. John became a major general <clears throat> and led the troops in uh, Quebec, where an outbreak of smallpox occurred. He died of the disease on June 2, 1776. While John was at war, Hannah assumed his duties at the lighthouse. She also raised their three children. Finally, in 1990, the U.S. government declared her to be an official keeper of the Gurnet Point facility, making her the first woman lighthouse keeper in history. And of course, that was posthumously. Um, after the death, then, then the next one is about Barbara Mabry. Mabry, is that said them? Edited these some. Sounds choppy. So this was about Barbara Mabry. After the death of her husband, Barbara Mabry served as keeper of the lighthouse on Key West, Florida, a post that she kept from 1832 until 1864. She was tending to her six children and doing daytime duties in 1846 when she noticed that the air had become still. As the hours passed, she watched the sky darken because of heavy cloud cover. Having ushered her children into the lighthouse, she sent her assistant to the mainland to warn residents that a storm was coming. A few Floridians sought shelter in the lighthouse, believing that its brick structure would hold up better than their wood frame houses. A few days later, a local reporter wrote that the hurricane <clears throat> was the most destructive within the memory of man. The lighthouse at Whitehead Point um, on our island was totally destroyed with all members of the keeper's family, seven in number, not a soul escaped. There were 14 bodies found <clears throat> in the vicinity of the lighthouse, but none was that of Mrs. Mabry. She had survived to bury all of her children and watch a new lighthouse be constructed. In 1847, she resumed her duties. And I skip down to um, Ida Wally Zarada Lewis. In 1869, Ida Lewis was featured on the cover of Harper's Weekly, a national publication. At that point in her history, most women were not the professional workforce or on the national stage, but Ida had been recognized as the bravest woman in America by the Society for, uh, of the American Cross of Honor. Her father had been the keeper of Lime Rock, Lime Rock Light, Rhode Island, when he died in 1857. A mother took over the chores. When the mother died in 1879, Ida, who had been assistant to both of her parents, was officially appointed lighthouse keeper by the U.S. Lighthouse Service, the predecessor of the U.S. Coast Guard. 
Over the years, she rescued eight men, none of whom wanted to admit being saved by a lone woman in a small boat. Then, in 1869, <coughs> two soldiers and a boy were tossed into the water from a small skiff. The boy drowned before Ida could reach the craft to which the soldiers clung. They were so, so grateful for Ida's actions that they told their story to a no local newspaper. The story was picked up by the New York Herald Tribune, and then the specifics of her previous rescues became known. Overall, during her 39 years at Lime Rock, Ida saved 18 lives, winning the Gold Life Saving Medal. On October 20, 1911, Ida Lewis uh, filled, the oil lamps, filled the lamps with oil, trimmed the wicks, and lit the lights. That night, she suffered a stroke and died four days later, a true American heroine. And this is the last one. Catherine Walker. Mind the lights, Katie. These were the last words spoken before his death in 1886 by John Walker, keeper of the Robins Free Flight, light, <clears throat> to his wife Catherine. Although she did just that in the straits between Manhattan Island and Staten Island in New York Harbor, it took nine years before the four foot ten inch, hundred pound woman was officially appointed because the government could find no men willing to take the job. Determined to have her children receive an education, this petite woman rode a dinghy two miles every morning to Staten Island to deliver the kids to school, and then two miles again to pick them up in the afternoon. Between 1886 and 1919, when she retired, she saved more than 50 fishermen's lives. Her obituary in the New York Evening Post ended with, In sight of the city of towers and the torch of liberty, lived this sturdy little woman, proud of her work and content in it, keeping her lamp alight and her windows clean so that New York Harbor might be safe for ships that pass in the night. So, again, the, the column kind of gives me an outlet for these kinds of little bits of um, historical information about the role that women have played that otherwise is just totally overlooked in our society. So, um, are there any other? Yes. Um, I, I like what Liz was saying about uh, people interpreting, uh, not, not just the comics, but articles in general. Right? I, one of the things that I try to do with my students is um, make them interpret the news from a sociological lens. And so, you know, one thing we could think about is that we don't all have to be journalists, right? We can you know, train people, right, to interpret what the journalists write through a sociological lens. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that was one idea that I had. And then another thing is that our, our university is, uh, at Fresno State, we're really focused on applied research, right, and, and getting out into the community. And, um, and uh, as part of that, uh, we have a, a list of experts uh, at the university that's distributed to the community and after that list came, it's only been like a year it came out, but after it's come out, we get calls all the time. Really? Emails and calls all the time from people in the community uh, when we weren't getting them before. Mm -hmm. right? And so that may be something to think about, too, is that you know, maybe we're just not making ourselves visible enough or available enough to journalists right. and to others who might you know, want, want to get our perspective. Right. Good point, yeah. yeah. I, I, and I live right next to Fresno, and I didn't even know about that. Mm -hmm. Huh. And it's been going on for a long time. Has it really? Yeah. The university you know, gets phone calls and they'll take who's ever on the list. Wow. So you can sign up for whatever you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so is it, is it kind of like a speaker's bureau? Or? Yeah, but yeah. it's not limited to speaking yeah. to yeah. large groups. Yeah. Consultants, with yeah. those kinds of things. Great, great. We're glad to hear about that. And I think we should be doing more of that. I think we should be getting um, outside of our classrooms. I never heard of sociology before I went to college. And I don't think that's unusual. I mean, oh, no, over the years. Oh, no, you're students now. Yeah. I mean, I taught for 36 years, and most of my students during those 36 years had never heard of sociology. There, there, there is kind of a caution um, in, in going 
taking sociology public, and that is, you don't want to get too technical. And I, I did this, and I've regretted it. But I did, I did a column, and I think it, it's, it's in the book back there, and it's called um, "Letting Genie Out of the Bottle." G I N I. Anybody know what that is? See, that's it. That's it. Nobody knows. Um, Genie is it's named after it's it's not an acronym it's a, an actual person's name it's named after an Italian uh, statistician who came up with a way of um, judging <coughs> social inequality um, the computation is kind of similar to the computation that you do when you show correlation okay so. Um, the, the, the score would go from zero to one. Okay. This line right here, okay, if this right here is percentage of the population, this would be one percent down here, ninety-nine percent here, one hundred percent here. Okay. So if if the if the equation shows the line that's a forty-five degree angle, that means absolute equality. In other words, <clears throat> if you look at this one percent right here, they have one percent. <clears throat> this is showing wealth, or yeah, showing wealth. They have one percent of the wealth. This twenty percent has twenty percent of the wealth. This eighty percent has eighty percent of the wealth. This hundred percent has a hundred percent of the wealth. So the wealth is evenly distributed. Everybody has the same wealth. Okay. Now, the Nordic countries come pretty close. This is the curve for the Nordic countries. And this is the equality line. So you can see that it just, it sags a little bit. And this is, um, this is Namibia. And can you see this line? Yep, the orange line that goes along here. And all of a sudden, it makes an exponential jump. Meaning that what? A very tiny percentage of the population has virtually all of the wealth. And the great majority of the population has virtually nothing. And for the United States, <coughs> I haven't really kept up with this, but when I, um, when I did this, um, the U.S. looked like this, and so the um, G coefficient was 0 0.45. Again, it goes from 0 to one, so 0 0.45. The higher the number, the worse the distribution of wealth. So in, this was in uh, 2010 that I did this. 2012, it was 0 0.476. 2013 was 0 0.48, so it's going up. Meaning what? That the distribution of wealth is becoming more unequal as we go along. And so I did a column about this. I shouldn't have because absolutely nobody understood. Okay. So 